Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, I just want to encourage everybody to ask questions on Slack because the fun part about having an Ask Me Anything with Chris is that uh, he doesn't shy away from any questions. So I, I, I will point out, I do shy away from Slack, though. I'm I'm not a huge user of Slack. I've used IRC for 27 years, 26 years. And I, you know, I use Discord for some game stuff. But Slack kind of... Uh, Kind of, kind of drives me crazy sometimes yeah. because it's so hard to search and find information sometimes, and and I think that it was kind of a step back because uh, you know, and this is something I hated about IRC too, where you know people could uh, you know spend their time improving documentation and all the rest, and then they would go into these real time chat channels, and it'd be like you would lose the information as soon as it scrolled past the top of the screen. So, so I'm sorry I'm not in the Slack channel with you, but yeah, I'll take any question they have. But uh, I, yeah, yeah. So I, I can I can read them. Yes. 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 So, but I apologize <laughs> for making you have to do that. So it's okay. Uh, so. Uh, uh, as we were talking about this before, you have been involved in open source for uh, 25 years. Okay. And uh, the furthest that I could track in your career was 22 years when you were an open source evangelist uh, for mm -hmm. VA Linux. Yeah. So when did you actually get it started and, and get involved in open source for the first time? And, and what made you stay? Um, so I was in university and um, I, uh, I was studying computer science. This was in uh, in Virginia and the United States. And the computer science lab where all the Unix machines were was constantly just packed with people. It was very hard to get a terminal. And it, honestly, the air conditioning didn't work very well. So it was very hot, very smelly, right? And so I didn't like going. So I would go at like midnight. I would go really, really late so I could go and get a terminal and get my work done. And so um, this was 1994, right? So I, uh, I had just, you know, Linux was just coming out. We started seeing the first Linux distributions right around then. And BSD had been around for a while. I'd messed with BSD for like five minutes. Um, and then I installed Slackware. I think it was Slackware or Yggdrasil Linux. And um, yeah, it was Slackware. And it was just no going back after that. Because I was like, oh, this is so much better. It was faster than the sun workstations that were coming off of a, a sun 10k i think machine um and it was it had really cool x windows and people were starting to really mess with user interfaces on linux and there was a lot of creativity at the time and so uh and i could just i could just install uh you know compilers and languages and have a lot of fun right so i was super into it and i i managed to do my my homework really really well which was really unusual for me because i was a terrible student okay uh, but i was able to do my computer science homework really well and so i was like wow this is really really great and so um uh it was before i graduated college because i didn't graduate for 10 more years um and i was working for a law firm in Washington, D.C. and as a tech guy for them. And then I, I went to the Silicon Valley. I was, I was hired by a company uh, called Tandem, uh, which uh, did fault tolerant computers. Uh, now they're part of HP, I think. Um, and when I was there, I, I found the local Linux users group, which was really a, a Unix users group in the Valley. And it was very small. It was like 10 people meeting at the local uh, burger joint. Right. And so I was like, but Linux is so exciting. You know, y'all are going to grow immensely, you know. And so uh, we, we, we did. I, we ended up growing the Linux users group from meeting in a Carl's Jr. You know, Cisco donated one of their executive briefing rooms and we grew it to about a thousand people. And we were super into Linux. We were just like, Linux, Linux, Linux. we all talk. <laughs> that's all we did is talk about Linux for like a year. Right. And, um, and I was working at Tandem at the time, and I was started doing some consulting. I, I consulted for SUSE Linux. I set up their first American English website, um, and that's how I became friends with Dirk and, and these people. And then, um, and I, I was doing some work for the Gap on their data warehouse. And that's when the owner of VA Linux, Larry Augustin, he's like, "Listen, I really need somebody to take over marketing." 
uh, for this company. And I was like, I'm not a good marketer. You don't want me for that job. And he was like, he's like, no, 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 no. You just need to warm a chair, book a couple ads uh, until we get a good marketer in. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that, you know? And so uh, I went into the role and, uh, and I, I did exactly that. I booked some terrible ads, uh, you know, like every font, every font, beautiful, beautiful <laughs> photos of machines. Like Annie Leibovitz took these photos and, and, and for machines that were going out of, out of production like that month, you know, just, just I, I'm terrible at that kind of advertising. At least, at least I was, I, I'd like to think I'm better now, but, but back then I was awful at that kind of, you know, paper magazine advertising, but I did what he, what he said, which was, I kept a hold of those ad spots, made sure they got booked. And then what I, what I did is I was like, you know what? we should just talk to the the nerds that love us and 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 who we love in open source software and so i spun up this whole community marketing thing i started sponsoring um oh let's see slashdot and some of these really early sites in cuz slashdot was falling over cuz they were having so much traffic about and they were basically it was an open source news site uh, a long time ago but it was very popular and so i i contacted them and i was like rob jeff you're falling over. Can I send you some machines? I've got some crappy machines here that I can like whip together for you, install Linux on and ship them out to you. They're like, oh, thank you so much. And so they had our company be the base ad. So when the ad system failed uh, at Slashdot, it would show this old VA Linux ad. And that's how they knew it had failed. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was like these machines again that we hadn't shipped for years. But yeah, um, so yeah. And so we spun up the whole, you know, uh, interacting with the open source community there and and that was actually super fun and i was there for four years so yeah that's how that's how i got there though i'm sorry i'm rambling on but no, that's yeah. okay yeah and so uh, what, what made you stay what would you say yeah it, so a couple things um one um being involved in open source has been my career right so i was at va linux for four years and i did a variety of open source or open source adjacent jobs, right? Um, you know, worked on the M&A strategy for that company. Uh, we went public, you know, we included all the open source people when we went public. And so, so we did a lot of stuff there. Um, and then I left there and I did a game company for 18 months and it was a disaster, right? It, it, if we could have done anything more wrong, we would have, right? Um, and so we're like, oh, this isn't working out. And so uh, we shut it down after 18 months or so. Uh, and I remember I was at a lunch with Greg Stein, who was a member of the Apache Software Foundation. I think he still is a member uh, and, and attached to the organization. And uh, sorry, sorry if I'm talking really fast for the translator. I need to slow down. So I, I apologize for that. I tend to talk super fast. Um, but uh, Greg was like, hey, uh, you know, we're looking for someone like you to run the open source programs at Google. And I was like, the search engine? He's like, yeah. And I was like, but what do you need an open source person for? He's like, oh, we've got ambitions. And I'm like, okay. But, you know, I had two job offers already. I was like, listen, I, I got some job offers. Do you really want to interview me? And they're like, yeah, no, no, we really want to interview him. All right, fine. So I went in and it turns out, by the way, if you're ever interviewing with a startup or with Google, have other offers. It's very handy. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, so, so Google felt a little competitive, I think. And um, yeah, so uh, I interviewed with 13 people in, that, that next week. And, uh, and I, I came to found, find out how the decision was made to hire me and I verified it. Uh, so my, my packet, we used to do these paper packets with all the feedback from the interviews. Uh, my packet went to the hiring committee and the hiring committee is like, oh my gosh, another open source person. We've interviewed everybody for this job. Right. And they're like, yeah, yeah. But you know, this is, this is the one everyone said we had to talk to. It's like, all right, fine. So they read the packet and they're like, well, I mean, he did fine in the engineering interviews. He did fine with the marketing people. He did fine with legal. He did fine with at the time, the, uh, the number three hire at Google he interviewed me as well. And this guy, Chris Ulick, who is this incredibly innovative person interviewed me and we all got on like a house on fire. And so they're like, so, 
So if he's terrible, we'll just fire him. We'll make him a sweet. We'll, we'll do something with him. But let's let's give him a try, right? Because uh, they Googled me and they're like, he's not a complete jerk. So let's 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 see if this works, right? So that so I got into work and I was supposed to work for Wayne Rosing, who by the way is a legend. He worked on the original Apple II and Macintosh teams. He not, not worked on he ran them, right? He's he's one of these secret like brilliant people in the Silicon Valley that nobody really talks about until you realize he could just like raise an eyebrow and hire 150 of the top computer scientists in the business, right? And I was like, I get to work for Wayne Rosing. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, right? That little fireworks are going off in my head. And I get to work and he's like, yeah, you're not working for me. And I'm like, but dude, <laughs> like, you're gonna work for Bill Corn because I'm gonna go build a, uh, I think the large scale synoptic telescope in Chile Right. So so he's going to go build this enormous telescope operation, which he did a wonderful job at. Uh, and so because we would we would stay in touch and because I love you know, astronomy and, and 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 basically I don't need to talk about that. But look into the LSST, especially if you're Chilean and you're watching this, uh, you know, because CCOS has, probably has some people from Chile watching. Find a way of working for the LSST. I can't think of a more exciting computer science environment, science environment, uh, in your country. So anyway, um, so, so anyway, so Wayne says, go work for Bill. So I, I, I didn't know who Bill was and I went into his office. I'm like, Hey, I'm your open source guy. And he's like, great, go, go open source guy things. And I'm like, you don't know what I do for a living, do you? And he's like, nope, nope, but, but you do. So you should go do it. And I'm like, okay. So I was like, what am I doing here? You know, and uh, and it turned out Bill would be the best manager that I've ever had at Google. Um, and, and my current manager at Yale is pretty great, though. He's like the second best. But like everyone's going to tell you, like working for Bill was a dream, right? He was so brilliant and so good. Uh, yeah. So I still really treasure that time where I worked for him. But we 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 only had one and one on a one a year. <laughs> so all of our meetings were like walk and talk meetings, like in the TV shows. Uh, where I'd say, hey, I need to do this thing. He's like, okay, go do it. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so I just go do it. And, and it was a, it was a time where Google was a lot more, uh, you know, from the hip in how we did our planning. So yeah. A anyway, it was a great time. So I, I know I'm talking a lot, but what was what was your next question? I, um, yeah, I think it, so. It sounds like uh, you were enabled to do your work or, or build a space for open source at Google from your yeah. own expertise. Um, which is uh, fascinating. And I know that you know also a lot about licenses and, and licenses are the very foundation of open source because yeah. without, we, we wouldn't even have this kind of practice. So what do you think are some current controversies or challenges or gaps that mm -hmm. uh, open, open source licenses have? Well, there's a couple of things really that stick out. So in the, in the mid nineties, we actually had this problem too, where people wanted to, uh, Let's see. They wanted to sort of say, hey, I'm OK with these people using my open source, but I don't want these people using my open source. So you see this right now with some people trying to create new open source licenses that restrict the use of uh, the software in like a reseller arrangement, like on a cloud service. Um, and you see other people who don't want their software being used by, say, the military, right? Uh, uh, or, 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 or bad people, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, so this, this was true in the nineties as well. So when the open source definition and the Debian free software guidelines are being codified and we were faced with a lot of unusual licenses, um, we created the no field of use restrictions. Um, and, and that, that kept things under control for a while. Um, but recently we've seen in the ethical license movement and the uh, various other movements, uh, efforts to change open source into something that can keep, say, a reseller from reselling software um, or a, uh, you know, or, or pacifist licenses to keep militaries from using them. Unfortunately, what what we don't talk about is where this went in the 90s. So, and I'm sorry, this is going to sound a little rough. Okay. Um, one of the things that we saw, uh, it started with not for use by the military. And then people are like, well, what does that really mean? Uh, we get that you want to be a, a pacifist, but do you, do you mean that the Navy shouldn't help? You know, because the Navy was a huge contributor to, to GCC at the time. 
right? Um, and so, and and frankly, the NSA, which is an American, you know, secret service, um, they were contributing to Linux uh, and the security layers of Linux because they wanted it to be more secure. So, like, should we not work with these people? You know, and some people, the answer was no. You should not work with those people. And it's like, well, ended up being not really tenable. And then people showed up and they said uh, software was not to be used by the state of Israel. And then people said not to be used by Jewish people. And then not to be used by uh, Islamic folks. And then it went sort of even worse, where people would say not for use by any member of the Catholic Church or by an, a, an abortion uh, uh, clinic. You cannot use the software if you work in an abortion clinic. Right. So, so we're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. This, <laughs> can we just stop for a second here? And this was so, about, yeah. So it was, it was getting crazy. It was crazy sauce, right? And the thing is, I, I don't mind people having their own personal ethics and their own religious ways. I mean, that's, I totally respect that. But software licenses were the wrong place to put these things. Um, uh, there was an early version of a, a now considered open source license, and I'm not going to say which one it was. Um, where it said, it, by adopting this software, you agree that Jesus Christ is your personal savior, which is something that's very, very important to religious people. But I'm like, but it doesn't belong in a software license, right? And as somebody who tracks licenses for a living and tracks the use of software under these licenses for a living, mm -hmm. it's a nightmare to keep track of what ethics mean, right? So um, there's a, a, a cutesy MIT variant that says for use... Uh, for only should be used for good and not evil. And they put the word should in there so that they could stay open source and wouldn't be seen as an additional restriction. But the thing is, if it's my idea of what's good and evil, is that enough? You know, who's the authority telling me what's good and what's evil and, and the rest. And so, you know, we asked for an exception and, and, and they, they took it off and, and then they went around saying, well, we, we let Google <laughs> be evil. And I'm like, that's cute, but Really, we're, we want to respect these licenses. And if we can't respect them, we just won't use the software, which is fine, which is a totally OK way of approaching it. All right. So so right now we have a controversy over uh, uh, over licenses that is very much like this, where we have people saying who should and should not use it from a commercial standpoint, it's saying we don't want cloud vendors using our software. And it's like, OK. I mean, that is completely reasonable. It's not open source, but it's fine for you to feel this way and to have a license like that. Uh, and in those cases, I just treat it like any piece of commercial software with a proprietary license. Um, and the only time I get uncomfortable is when they try to put on the imprimatur, uh, the, the, they try to put on the clothes of, of open source and try to take advantage of open source while not being open source. And it's like, you know, it's okay to be proprietary. You know, I, I know a lot about proprietary software. We ship a ton of it at, at Google, but we don't pretend it's open source when it's not. Um, and so so that's that's sort of a thing that's going on right now. And then um, the, the ethical license movement, I think it's actually deeply troubled because the definitions are very, very hard to align with. So that's why I'm actually super into, so the, the code of conducts, that we've adopted across our projects at Google and you're seeing being adopted across the software industry, they're written very, very carefully so that they both express the goals of uh, beha behavior and, and ethics and morals uh, of the software authors, but it doesn't present as an additional restriction on the software itself, on the software licenses. Because if you look at open source software license, they, they're very clear, they say, listen, if you create another document and attach it to this software that is more restrictive than this document, you are no longer an open source project. You know, you're not an Apache project. You're not a, uh, you know, uh, a GPL project because you've added an additional restriction. So don't play that game, right? And again, it's okay to have a non-open source license. It's just don't call yourself GPL or Apache if you're playing this game. And the code of conducts as, as we've adopted them, as other people have adopted them, respect that, right? And so I think that's a, a much better way of getting to where people want to be ethically and morally than adopting new licenses that try to, frankly, they're, they're not specific enough on what good and bad is.
So, so it's very, very hard to comply with. And so the answer is not, you know, so people get really upset when I say this, but it's like, it, it's okay for Google to not use that software. It's too hard for us to figure out how we can use it legally. Right. So, so we just don't use it. We just say, you know what? It's okay. We're not going to use that one. Right. Because it's too hard to figure out. Right. And, and that's just part of the job now. Yeah. And, and there are things that belong in a license and, and, and things that don't, as you were describing before. Um, another uh, aspect of open source that is, I, I mean, it's very characteristic of open source is forking. And mm -hmm. I know that you are very passionate about forking. So I was wondering. I love it. You, yeah. Yes. I was wondering if you can tell us about a time that you worked uh, with a fork and mm -hmm. what reactions that inspired. Yeah. So. So a uh, software fork, I, you know, I'm sure that everyone is familiar with what it is, but it's when you take a code base and you take it in a different direction, right? And and you you try to do something that maybe the original maintainers they're like, ah, we're not going to go that way, but go for it, you know. Um, so that's what a fork sort of is. It's it's you're making a decision that the main li mainline maintainers maybe aren't so comfortable with. So if you go back in the history of just the Linux kernel, there was a time where um, so most most of the the mid to late '90s, the CPUs that Linux was running on were uh, multi CPU configurations or single threaded CPUs. Um, you know, and most of the time when Linux was being run, it was being run on a single CPU. Right. So the Linux operating system was very much oriented on single CPU, single threaded operation, trying to be as performant as possible in that environment. And we were just starting to get quad and, and eight core machines, reference machines out of Intel. We had Spark machines with 16, 32 you know, you know, cores. We had SGI machines with the, the NUMA memory uh, where you could have multiple access memory from multiple CPU cores. Um, and they all wanted Linux to run well on them. But Linux had to make a decision what memory model was going to work best for both the single-threaded Linux users, but also for the multi-core Linux users that were coming into prominence. So what they did is they actually said, well, we, we don't have a choice here, right? There's, there's no one choice that makes sense for everybody. So let's have multiple memory models, right? Um, for the kernel. So there was, I think, three uh, declared forks of the Linux memory subsystem. And they went off and they did their own thing. Uh, and then about, it was, it was a couple of years. Uh, you could still use the alternative memory models in the kernel, but they ended up settling on one. I think it was Andrew Morton's uh, memory model. Uh, as being the best overall candidate for default choice in the Linux kernel. And so that was actually really educational for me because this was happening right as I was sort of growing in, in the Linux business. And I was watching this going, wow, that was really a great way of experimenting with different paths. And then Linus, to his credit, he, he pulled it back together, right? So later when we, when we had a problem with Linux uh, on Android, so... Um, in the old days, the scheduler in in Linux uh, that chooses which process get to, gets to do what was very, very aggressive in using the power of the CPU that was being used by the computer. Um, and so when you're building a mobile processor, uh, sorry, a mobile phone, you know, you need to actually be really mellow. You say, listen, we're going to go into a sleep state for all but the very core pieces of the operating system. And we're going to keep that quiet too, uh, because we don't want to use up all the battery. And the radio is going to use a lot of power, so we need to keep it in a sleep state, unless uh, an application needs it or we have a message coming in. Right. So Linux was like, no, 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 we're going to use everything, and and that's what it's really, really good at is using the resources of the computer. Um, and so we wrote a we forked the kernel, we created something called a wake lock, which basically kept the scheduler from waking up certain things. Uh, and thus, in, you know, we, we made it possible to have an all day phone that would not chew up its battery in, in four hours or two hours of use. Um, and people were super upset with us. There were, there were some folks in the arm 
uh, part of the kernel that were just like, we can't believe you're doing this. I can't believe you're forking the kernel. And I was like, you should be fine with this. And, and I stood in front of a crowd of about 300 kernel developers, some of which were really upset with me. And I said, listen, I, let me tell you what's going to happen, right? We're going to try this. And two or three years later, we're going to come back into the main line or the main line is going to come over to us, right? Because we're shipping this software, right? And whenever you ship software, you're forking, you know, you're, you're putting a, a flag in the ground and you're saying, this is what we're going to be doing. Right. So, uh, so it took about two or three years and then we came back in and, and Russell to his credit and Linus to his credit, they're like, no, 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 this, it's really important that we find a way of making this work in the main line because otherwise system on, uh, the system on chip vendors like Qualcomm and all the rest, they're not going to pay attention to the Linux team. They're going to pay attention to Android because that's who's shipping. Right. And in that intervening two or three year period, Android grew from, hundreds of thousands of handsets to millions of handsets. And now it's on two and a half billion, you know, devices. So because the Linux team was flexible and because we were flexible too, you know, we should give some credit to us. Um, you know, we were able to stay in the main line and we were able to take the operating system in a direction that was good, was good for it. So yeah, f I think forking is super important. And the best thing about real open source licenses, by the way, is they encourage and allow both forking and realignment as people grow and change. And that's really, really important. Um, because if you look at the not open source licenses, what they don't allow is A, they don't allow you to fork and they don't make it possible to realign if they do. So it's, it's one of those things where without forking, we don't have a way of experimenting with software. And and it's just super, super important. So yeah, so I'm a, I'm a huge fan of forking. It's like, I, I sort of believe that forking is inherent in open source and you should, you should value it and celebrate it. So there you go. Awesome. That's a really interesting story. Um, so, uh, Let's talk a little bit about community, which is kind of where you started uh, mm -hmm. with open source. Um, so what open source project stands out to you uh, for how open and inclusive the community is? Wow. Um, this is like, you know, unpack the world, you know. Um, so we've been running the Summer of Code, which is a, has been a student oriented program for, I think, 16 years now. Um, and, uh, it's been remarkable because it shows me the projects that are a, not just want to be good mentors and, and welcoming to new people, but actually succeed at that. Right. And so every year we, we, at the end of the program, we go through and we look at how it went for a given organization with their students? Did they get in their feedback in time? Did they do all this stuff? And uh, it's it's been fascinating, right? So, and there's some groups uh, that have been in the summer of code now for all 16 years or, or you know, 13 of the 16 years because we got to them later. And, and so I would just say, go to that website, look at the projects we've chosen um, and those 201 have really great onboarding of new developers. They have bugs that are tagged just for newcomers. And then what I'd say is, uh, depending on the person who's watching this, who wants to get into open source, I'd be like, what's interesting to you? Because if you go to that list of summer of code organizations and you say, you know what, I really like JavaScript or I really like games or I really like mapping or anything. It doesn't have to be anything that I've just listed. We, we have a project for you. Uh, and, and also for your skill level, right? Because, you know, honestly, you know, when you talk about the kernel team and, and these very complicated teams like, like, like Kubernetes and Istio and Native, you need a really solid knowledge of not just programming, but also of networking or system architecture or, or, or whatever, right? So I, I think it's okay for people to say, I, I want to be part of the Kubernetes team but I'm going to go do this thing over here first for a while. Sorry, I don't know how oh, to help with that. My little here Google home is, is, is <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so, so all I'd say is that, um, go to that list, use that as your first hit because it, it, they're not on that list by accident. Okay. Uh, they have been judged and found wonderful. So go, go use that list. That's your best first place to go. Uh, in, in my opinion. So, and then just map it to your skill level and, and then you'll find something that works well for you. Awesome. Um, so kind of uh, going, looking back uh, and thinking of your trajectory uh, in, in this sector, mm -hmm. um, how would you say that open source has changed and how, how do you think that open source has changed the, the software industry? So, so when I got started, there were a lot more people in universities and colleges who were taking part in open source software, and there weren't as many corporate types. Um, and so it was, it was a different kind of world. Nowadays, I really think that the majority of open source developers that I meet uh, are either students who are trying to get into the world of open source software and get hired uh, by companies that sponsor development. And excuse me. And when I say sponsor development, I don't mean like they say, okay, you're going to work in open source for a living. It's they're working on implementation inside a given company or deployment of open source software inside a company. Um, and then they find themselves patching. They find themselves improving these, these projects as part of the, their job, but also because they want to improve these projects. Um, and so that's sort of the first part of the question of how has it changed? Um, there's this picture that people give of people toiling breathlessly and in some basement somewhere. And it's just not true. You know, um, you know, I mean, yes, there are, I'm sure a couple of folks like that, but in my experience, it's people generally who are employed or are in a university. Uh, and, and more likely are employed in a technology oriented job where they're maintaining systems or deploying systems. And, and that actually goes to the second part of your question, which is how did you see it rise up? Right. Um, so there was a time when I first got started with, with Linux, where the only people using Linux were nerds in college, you know, and there wasn't a lot of use, uh, yet because the internet was just growing. Right. But as the internet grew, and this is actually where the Apache project, uh, the HTTP server uh, in, in Apache became so important. So uh, when the internet was growing, it was growing really fast. So people would go to Sun, they would go to SGI, and they would go to Microsoft and IBM and Oracle, and they'd be like, hey, we need to stand up a website, clearly, can you help us, right? And they would come back and say, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll charge you $300,000, and uh, we're, we're going to need to charge every user of your website, because that's how we charge for things. And they're like, what are you talking, that's crazy, you know? And so they're like, well, okay, well, while we're waiting to figure out what that contract looks like, we're going to download the Apache server and we're going to, we're going to stand up a basic website. Right. And what happened was kind of universally people are like, well, wait a second, why would I opt into some wacky contract that's going to cost us a fortune? Doesn't understand what the web is about when I can just keep using Apache. Right. And I can stick a MySQL backend on it. I can, write our own code, we can, you know, get some really pretty graphics in there. And so Linux and Apache and MySQL all grew up uh, with the internet during its hyper, like hyper growth explosive phase. And so the commercial vendors were like, oh, we have to get our hands around this thing. We have to figure this out. Otherwise, we're not going to be in business anymore. Right. So they were like, OK, I'm going to come to understand Apache on Sun. I'm going to come to understand you know, what it would take to serve from Windows or the Mac or something, right? And almost universally, as these things grew, you had the big scaling companies like Yahoo and then Google and AltaVista and the rest. And Yahoo was running on BSD because there was no way they were going to be paying a per CPU license to anybody. Um, and then when Google grew up, you know, we were Linux and our, we had backends that were written in our own file system. Um, but we were using a ton of Python. 
to do our basic data processing work, you know, and whenever somebody would say, hey, you know, you should use the software, but it's got a per client license or a per CPU license. We're like, why would we ever do that? That's going to keep us from growing the way that we need to grow. Uh, and so open source software was always there for people who needed to grow fast. Uh, and frankly, commercial software wasn't. And to a great degree, isn't. Right. So, you know, that's uh, sort of the growth of open source. And then as people started doing cloud computing, it wasn't cloud computing on proprietary platforms. It was scaling Linux. Right. So managing, helping people manage Linux, basically. Right. And, you know, that's what we do in Google Cloud. We basically we pride ourselves on being the best at scaling these open source projects. And when those projects didn't exist, we created them. This is why we created Kubernetes. This is why we created Knative. This is why we created Istio and Go and, and, and TensorFlow and, 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 uh, is because we needed it, right? There was not going to be a world where these projects couldn't exist. They had to exist. Otherwise, cloud couldn't be competitive, you know? And so, yeah, that's why we have the tools we have now. And, and um, I'm... Uh interpreting from your response that uh, maybe the the decision to open source kubernetes uh -huh. uh, was uh, was tied to uh, to having a, a more competitive platform. Yes. absolutely yeah. yeah I mean so here's the thing so inside Google we had a tool called Borg and it manages our systems um, and we have a lot of computers I think it's fair to say that um, and we manage them really, really well for search, for ads, for apps, for cloud. Um, but it wasn't the kind of thing that anyone else could make use of. It was so specific to our infrastructure and the rest. So there was a team that was going to rewrite Borg. It was called the Omega team. And uh, they were going to rewrite Borg to make it more portable, more separable from our infrastructure. And they failed. And then we took what they learned and we pulled it back into Borg. And then another team tried and they failed. And then a team said, well, what if we just took the subset that could be used externally to help people manage large installations in the cloud, right? And, and that was what Tim Hawk and, and folks like Joe Beta and the rest um, started working on. And that's what became Kubernetes, right? So, and it was going to be open source from the start. You know, we had talked about it, how to how to best release it in a way that would be re that would actually serve the goal of making cloud loads workloads manageable. Um, and and that's what we did. So yeah, um, it, it's funny because a lot of times at Google, people think, oh, you know, is there like a big complicated process? And you know, I, I checked with our our leadership at the time. I'm like, this is a thing we're going to do, right? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. I'm like, sounds good. Okay, so that was kind of what it took to release uh, Kubernetes. Um, and it, it's funny because Istio, in some ways, is a recognition that. Our internal network management systems are pretty remarkable at Google. I mean, we have an absurd network. I mean, there's no other word for it, right? Um, we have un undersea cables. We have, you know, landline cables going between data centers and, and between Metropops that I have, I, and I've been in the business for a long time. I've seen some impressive infrastructure. I've never seen anything like Google, right? And so we all, we said, we asked ourselves the same question. It's like, listen, People don't need to manage, you know, YouTube traffic in Tokyo, right? But they do need to manage a zillion, you know, uh, deployments uh, in their retail stores. Uh, they need to manage their networks in a secure and, and facile, very, very flexible way. Um, so what would the subset of our network management ethos look like and that was what istio became right um so yeah so that's kind of you know we we will often do this we're like listen we want to bring to our customers some of what we've learned in our 20 plus years of, of operation but they don't need a metro pop in tokyo you know they need every 7-eleven in tokyo or something I don't know, i'm just making things up now but it's <laughs> 
it, it's like so we try to try to zero in on on what it is that a sophisticated user needs and is not getting from current networking and and this is another thing it's like i remember it was like 12 years ago we were having real problems using some of the more complex and really fantastic network fabric switches uh, the chips from vendors like Athros and Broadcom um, because there just wasn't Linux support for it. So we we did it ourselves. We wrote it um, and we released it and put it into Linux. And it's like as, as cloud rose up, there was some real problems with the virtual I.O. layers for virtual machines. So we've been funding the work on eBPF. Uh, and other people have been too, so it's not just all Google. And, you know, uh, but yeah, it's like, you know, folks like Dave Miller and the rest, it's like they know where they need to improve. And and we just try to help wherever we can because that's what's good for, it's, it's good for us, it's what's good for the internet, it's what's good for the web, so, yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, all this experience and stories and trajectory with all of us. Um, we have one question on mm -hmm. the Slack channel um, from Mariano Renteira, Renteria. Sorry. Um, do you think that uh, Latin, Latin particip so participation from Latin America is increasing in open source or not? Mm -hmm. So I, I do think it's, it's increasing in open source. Um, so over my career, there's always been like a core group of open source people out of Mexico City, out of uh, Madrid, out of, uh, I'm just looking at, well, Latin America, it's not in Spain, but I know that. Um, you know, there's always been a remarkable community in Brazil as well, especially in like, you would see them at the Fiesley conference that I just, I super miss that conference. I don't know what happened to it. Um, but like, there's always been a really wonderful group of true free, free software and open source enthusiasts uh, throughout Latin America. Um, and I think what's happened over the last about 10 years is it has grown in prominence, especially as Latin American companies and universities have come to realize how important open source is uh, for giving you a leg up, you know? Um, it, it's, it's very rare for me to find a company that doesn't use an enormous amount of open source software. And so what they need is people who can help them use it well. And so th I think that's been sort of the push me, pull you of open source in Latin America and actually in, uh, in America, in all the markets, right? So there's been a uh, remarkable growth there. Um, so yeah, that's what I think. Great. So um, I think we have a few more minutes for questions. Uh -huh. I just want to invite people to ask them uh, on the Slack channel. I don't really see the live transmission. Um, I don't know if somebody else is checking on that. Okay, Chris can check on, on the live transmission. Thank you, Chris. Um, I, can, I can load it on another screen, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I've got, I, I just loaded it here on the side. So, uh, buenos dias, Maria y Chris, uh, Benandato, what a snowball effect from Javier. Uh, there's some people saying hi, you know, so. <laughs> awesome. Hi, hello. Uh, I think we have, okay, we have some questions coming in on Slack. Uh, so Francisco Trevino is asking, what is your forecast about the relationship between big corporations, uh, for example, Google, Facebook, etc., mm -hmm. usage or not of free software projects, libraries that are more strict, uh, for example, GPL. Uh, you've clearly explained how problematic that relationship can be, even legally, how can both the corporation and the free software community benefit from the uh, from a synergetic collaboration? So did he say GPL or AGPL? GPL. Okay, yeah, because we've been using the GPL license and releasing stuff under the GPL license for 20 years. Uh, that is an open source license, to be clear, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we know exactly how to use it. And I'm very, very comfortable with the GPL. Uh, I can't speak for Facebook or 
those other people. I, I don't work for them. Um, but big corporations, in my experience, have have become quite comfortable with uh, with the Linux kernel's use of the GPL. So sometimes in other large corporations, not Google, there's been some some difficulty accepting the GPL or GPL version three in certain cases. Um, but, you know, like, so for instance, we actually don't have GPL version three software in certain devices that we ship from our hardware division uh, or an Android because the reality of the, the telephone business, the cell phone business is they want to lock the loads and GPL V3 does not allow for that. Right. So, um, so it, it comes down to what are you shipping? You know, um, if you're not shipping anything, all of the open source licenses are perfect for you. Uh, if you're shipping in certain ways, you need to think about what each given license impl- implies. And so some companies, what they do, instead of trying to have a subtle process like that, they will instead just say, you know what? Uh, GPL is too tricky, except for in the Linux kernel. Let's just not worry about that for a while. And they use Apache, they use BSD, they use MIT, you know, and that's that's a fine reaction, you know, to to the increasing complexity uh, that some of these licenses represent. I mean, it wouldn't it wouldn't work at Google because you know we are flexible. We we try to be as you, you know flexible as possible when it comes to licenses. Um, but I'm talking about open source licenses. When it comes down to commercial licenses, I bring in the lawyers. They go and they go through all the text, and you know, and we work with them to look after that software. But yeah, I, I think that answers this question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, we have a question by Arian Navarro. Mm-hmm. Uh, she says, from Chris, or maybe to Chris, do you think the open source ethics can survive in places so controlled like China and whose mm-hmm. policies are being replicated around the world? Okay, um, let's see. Um, so I, I don't live in China. I don't know if you... But uh, and I, I don't work for the Chinese government, but I will say I've been actually super impressed with how uh, Tencent and Alibaba and all of the sort of Shenzhen companies have adopted Go. And like I don't, people don't know this, and it's such a great story. Um, it turns out if you go to Shenzhen um, and most of Chinese social media, e-commerce uh, infrastructure is running on Go. That is the back end for China. And I, I have to tell you, I'm really proud of that because as the company that released Go, I'm like, I'm so excited that people are using Go like this, right? And, and it's a testament to its scalability and its utility and its security. I, I just, I, I admit, I don't really see countries. I just see users of Go, you know? Um, so... Uh, so the, the question is is not a, not about Go, but I just want to point out I'm so proud of how Go has grown in China, in America, in Europe. I mean, it's just, it's such a great language. Anyway, um, but do I think the open source ethics can survive in a place so controlled like China? So what's funny about it is there's a question of what do you mean by open source ethics? Like, is, it, do you think that China doesn't comply with open source licenses um, and Usually what we see in any country, honestly, is people adopt open source software and they don't really understand the licenses because they're hard to understand. They're, and sometimes they're hard to comply with because you don't understand the license. You can't, can't comply with it. Um, so what we've seen in China, in all the innovative economies of the world, uh, is people will start with just adopting and they won't understand how to share code, uh, kernel drivers, that kind of thing, uh, along with uh, shipping, some piece of hardware or software. Uh, and then as those companies grow, they come to understand what their obligations are. And, and it's not because it's an obligation that's being mandated by the state or being because they're afraid of a court case. Because to be frank, most people in China, they're not afraid of American or European courts when it comes to copyright issues, right? Um, but the reason they end up complying is because it makes it easier for them to adopt the software, right? So as uh, a company like MediaTek, which makes a uh, small system on chips for inexpensive devices and, and expensive devices, um, you know, they 
had a hard time getting their hands around this, but now they're they're great. You know, they release kernel drivers just like everybody else. They they really have come to to see the value of, and it's kind of like the forking argument earlier. First thing people do is they do their own thing, and then they say, oh, you know what? It makes a lot more sense if we're part of the main line, right? And so open source licensing encourages this, and so I think it's actually a great aspect of the licenses that we just say, okay, here's what we expect. And then we tell people like, this is the expectation. If you're using a GPL kernel, you're going to need to release these, these kernel drivers and the rest. And they go, oh, well, we couldn't do that. Right. And it's like, yeah, you can. And then they do. And they're like, oh yeah, uh, it made a lot of sense for us to do that. And it's like, yeah, it does. And, and sometimes that's a multi-year process, you know? And the thing is, I have been in open source for a very long time. So I've seen a lot of companies start with like, no way, we're never touching this stuff to, wow, we're using the heck out of it, but we're never releasing software. And they go, oh, we're, we're totally releasing software because it's what's good for us. And, and it, I've seen it every time. So I just, I, I'm super patient. So when I talk to somebody, I'm like, hey, can we get a, a, a the, the code for this driver? And they go, oh no. And I'm like, well, you know, let's talk about this. Let's see how we can find a path forward. Um, yeah. And then there's, you know, there's a question in this that's a little larger uh, about Chinese government's interactions. And I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. So, yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, we have one more question uh, here from the from the stream that uh, Gris shared. Um, from Francisco, it looks like. Uh, the open source community, it's an interesting question. The open source community cool. should collaborate with or against the big four. So I think- Is the big four Facebook, Amazon, MAGA. Apple, yeah. and Google? I is think that, so, yeah. Because like Netflix is sometimes in there and sometimes they're not, you know? Um, so should should the open source community collaborate with or against the big four? You know, I'm I, if people feel like they don't want to work with Google, I get it. It's okay. You know, um, I would hope that they would use the software we've released though, because it's great. You know, so it's funny because people are like, "But aren't you afraid of somebody competing with you with your own software?" And I'm like, "No, that's fine. It's you know, we, when we release Go, when we release Kubernetes, we don't release them thinking that nobody will ever." Uh, we, we we don't need people to to like us, you know, through these releases. You know, we we release software for our own reasons, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I would hope that they would see Google as their friend, you know, and they would work with like like suppose you become like a super Go user. I want to see you write libraries for Go, I, and you're like, but wouldn't that advantage Google? I'm like, yeah, I guess, but mm -hmm. it would also advantage everyone using Go. It's like yeah, I would. I want to see people really dig into Kubernetes and Istio, and they're like, "But wouldn't that improve Google's use of Kubernetes and Istio?" I'm like, "Yeah, but it would also improve everybody else's, right?" So, in some ways, open source is a great way of working with people that maybe you don't want to work with so much because it advantages everybody, right? Um, yeah. So that you know, that said, there are some people who really dislike the big four, and there's no world where I need to tell them to like us, right? I would hope they would give us a chance as people and as technology people. And, our, and I hope they would give our software a chance. But I get that sometimes people are not always super comfortable with Facebook and stuff. But, you know, I would only say I work at Google for a long, I've worked at Google for a really long time. And I've been really super impressed with my coworkers. So... I would I would hope you give them a chance to be good for you. That's all. But, yeah. um, a question from Javier Cortavitarte. Uh, what are what areas open source projects do you believe have a great potential of growth or adoption mm -hmm. similar to Kubernetes? So probably the steepest growth curve of any of our projects. So Kubernetes has been remarkable in how it's grown since we've released it I don't know, five years ago, right? Um, but if I were looking at anywhere and it's actually a, a very controversial area, um, from a computer science perspective, not from like a, you know, business or ethics perspective. Um, but TensorFlow has the possibility of 
really changing computer science um, fundamentally, right? And so I would say that, and, and, and if you don't want to work with TensorFlow and you want to use PyTorch, whatever, I think that these deep learning systems, these convolutional neural networks, anyone who can get their hands around that technology and really come to use and understand it, I think that they're they're writing a, a golden ticket for themselves, right? So it'd be like joining Kubernetes in 2016, you know, or, you know, joining, I don't know, Go in 2010, you know? Like it's, you're really, you're attaching yourself to an incredible like runaway locomotive. And so, you know, and, and when you start thinking in terms of these deep neural networks at convolutional neural networks, and deep learning, you really look at computer science differently, right? And and there's so many exciting projects in that world, uh, or just around system management. You know, it's like we, 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 we sort of talk about internally about bringing machine learning to systems management, to network optimization, to power optimization. And it's just like sticking these really smart systems and feeding them really good signals and training them against those signals. It's, it's just a different way of thinking that's remarkable. So I, I would ask people to start messing around with that. I mean, so here's the thing. So uh, coupled with that, you know, so I, I get students asking me, they're like, well, would you go into computer science today? And the thing that would get me going into computer science today in, in university as a young person is probably the neural network stuff. But I have to admit, it, I would also say if you can get into synthetic biology and start learning about CRISPR and some of these techniques, it feels like computer science in the 60s and 70s. Like the incredible future that's coming from synthetic biology is I wish I could, I wish I could go back in time and be a young person. I, I wish I could be 18 years old going into a, a, a new career. But I, I wouldn't give up what I've had. I've had a wonderful career and I have a wonderful family. I don't want to like travel in time or, or become young again. But like, seriously, like I say this to my daughter. She doesn't, she's not interested at all in this. But like any of you who are just about to sort of figure out what it is, look into some of these other things. That's all I say. I, I'd welcome you in open source software, but check out synthetic biology. It's incredible. So, all right. Uh, great. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, for. Uh, sharing all these experiences. I think we run out of time uh, for questions now, um, but we had a, a very, very lively conversation. Oh, and everybody, yeah. And thank you everybody who submitted questions uh, uh, through the live stream. I think we, we got most of them. Uh, yes. Thank you for and, and, and I'm sorry if my my Spanish is terrible. I, I know how to say lo sientos to apologize for my <laughs> poor Spanish. So, but yeah, I, I wish I could have done all this in, in Spanish, but that would have been a, a mess. So I apologize. So. All right, Chris, Maria, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today in this keynote. It was a pleasure to hear so many stories, so many inspirational messages and have the opportunity to share. Thank you both for the great work that you're doing to propel the open source communities. Thank you for believing in this effort and for helping close the gap with Latin America and bring more of this amazing talent to the game. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elise. Thank you so much for having me.